like to thank the um, speaker, the organizers of this conference very much for having me come. I think it's incredibly amazing there's people in the room I actually don't already know. Um, and I think since I'm the last speaker, we should probably give them a hand for their efforts. And also, since I'm the last speaker, I should really try to get out on time, because otherwise I'd be uh, standing between an Englishman and his beer. So, <laughs> uh, so, all right. So I have an enormous amount of ground to cover. So somebody mentioned that they were happy that somebody from the N category camp was coming to talk to you people. It's a little bit inaccurate about me. In the first place, as far as I'm concerned, n equals 2. I never went beyond that. <laughs> because I always believed that during, despite the, the string revolution, that space-time was four-dimensional. And I thought the categorical ladder just stopped in the right place. That the reason there's no interesting higher weak categories is because we only live in four dimensions. But the other thing is that although my, my earlier work in quantum gravity had to do with um, that sort of category theory. I mean, um, the models for quantum gravity I constructed can be thought of as functors from a simplicial complex thought of as a higher category to a representation category. And that's, that's a very pretty way of thinking about them. But I mean, I originally started by developing a language for quantizing bits of geometry. The representation theory of the Lorentz algebra gives you, the unitary representation theory gives you a, a quantum mechanics in which there are operators that correspond to geometrical objects. And when I finally figured out how to piece them all together so they would describe the geometry of a simplicial approximation to a space-time manifold, I then later realized I turned out that I was just summing over functors. So the, the functor category, the comma category between the, the category of quantum geometries and this sort of space category thought of as a, a simplicial complex, a la street and orientals. That comma category has a natural way of being summed over. And that, that took some doing. So um, that turned out to give a, 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 a very attractive model for quantum general relativity. But the problem is that it isn't independent of the simplicial complex. You, you, you put a constraint on it that destroys the, the theorem that says that if you take all the maps into a, any tensor category, you, you get a topological field theory. So it's not a topological theory, which is good because gravity isn't. But it means in order to try to find the invariant theory, you have to sum over all triangulations. So we're summing over all four-dimensional simplicial complexes. And this point of view was developed by Carlo Rovelli. It's called the group field theory point of view. And it's a very beautiful point of view because it says space-time is a quantum process a la Feynman, that it's a superposition of different combinatorial space-times, and we have to sum them to calculate physical quantities. This is a very beautiful picture. So it, it, it does make a step in the direction of replacing the underlying point set with a, a categorical object. But there's something missing here. Because if you just naively sum over all triangulations, then despite all the wonderful coincidences that make the state sum finite in each triangulation, which was actually uh, quite a major step. I mean, most people think, thought it wouldn't work. And it, it, it's, it's quite tricky how you regularize it so it does work. But the regularization doesn't spoil any of the symmetries. So we've gone all that far. We found a, a um, a quantum theory of four-dimensional general relativity, which is perturbatively finite. Each term in this series, if we think of it as a perturbation series, is finite. And then we still have this problem that we have to sum over an infinite number of them, and that whole result sort of gets lost. So this is very sad. But there should be a physical resolution of this. And so you see, there, there's a development within classical general relativity, which sometimes goes after the name, under the name of holography, which says that the amount of information that can actually be transferred from a finite system to an external observer 
has only a finite dimension. So I've been taking the point of view that we have to synthesize these ideas about this quantum geometry with the relativity to the observer in order to get a really finite theory. That if you took a, a simplicial decomposition that had too many uh, simplices in it, then the information in it couldn't get out to infinity because it would just disappear into a black hole, and therefore the sum is regularized by the physics itself. I sometimes call this the principle of quantum self-censorship. And so the principle of um, <coughs> Holography, it says that if you have a finite region here, I'm oversimplifying enormously. It's general relativity, so you always have to be very delicate about what the real statement is. There's only a finite dimensional amount of information which is proportional to the area in Planck scale terms. Okay. So, but that's finite. So that means if you have observers in the causal future of this thing, there's only so much information that can get out. And so I've been adopting the point of view that the geometry of this region is only an organization of the information that can be observed outside it. Now this is a bit counterintuitive. I'm saying you can't have operators inside it. If you have operations inside it, it's no longer quantum. You're, you're, you're collapsing the wave packet inside it. But also, in uh, gravity, you're really interested in regions that are so small that if you try to put anything inside them to make a measurement, you disturb it so badly that no information gets out at all. It makes a little black hole, which is really the source of the holography. So um, you have to think about the only meaningful statement about a the geometry of a region in spacetime is how, what can an effect can it have on the observation of an external observer after the region in spacetime is over. Okay, so uh, there's a quote from Einstein that I thought was worth repeating that I just read recently. He said that because the initial human experience in geometry was related to the surface of the Earth, people developed an unfortunate intuition that somehow the space-time was objective because a place meant, you know, a place. But in general, in space, this, this, this wasn't so. Um, I thought it, it was a good way of thinking about it. So we shouldn't think that, that, that space-time is, is real in any naive sense. When you think about a quantum process, if you use the word real, you get into trouble. Just think about the two-slit experiment. Is the electron that went through the first slit real? Yes. Is the one that went through the second slit real? Yes. Well, isn't the charge two then? No. OK, so you know, um, but um, so I've been trying to understand then how to make a mathematical formulation of the kind of geometry that would really appear in quantum general relativity. So the idea would be that each observer could observe some finite amount of information. And the information could come out in a very different form. For instance, if you're near a black hole, if you're falling in, so you're a free-falling observer, you don't see anything particular, so you would see information about what was actually inside. But if you're suspended outside, you know, somebody's holding a rope, then you see a black body radiation. And so in other words, you see what appears to you thermal radiation. And then whatever is going on inside the region that's almost a black hole but not quite uh, would be a, a slight distortion of that. And yet the amount of information you would see would be the same. So different observers could detect the same information but in very different ways. So what I believe is that there would have to be some translation laws that would tell you how to reinterpret the information that the different observers saw and then the, the description of the geometry here would have to be described in terms of the information each observer could see and uh, have to have consistency relations. So this is a picture of a site. And so what I'm saying is that it lives in the category of sheaves over the site. It's the site of observers. Now, this is subtly but profoundly different from what Chris was talking about. He was talking about his site of contexts. 
So in this situation, we would not expect things to go abelian, because you could try doing different experiments to probe this and seeing what you saw. You know, shine a light in different ways and see what you saw. The thing has to be reprodu reproducible or we can't do science. Um, so uh, what you would want would be to describe something like a Hilbert space and an algebra of operators of things you could observe here that would you tell you something about what was in this region. This is time. I hope that was obvious. Uh, and that would, um, that would mean that there would have to be non-commutative structures in here. And what I believe is that the empirically definable regions in a space-time which is quantum mechanical uh, conjecture The observable subregions of a quantum uh, region in spacetime form a non distributive lattice. In other words, no absolute point set. So um, I think Einstein's remark sort of motivates that. But oh, say, why do I believe that? Well, I have a Gedanken experiment. This is way I'm pretending I have a quantum theory of gravity in a minute. But let's say, first off, you have a state of, gra of, of this spacetime that has one particular metric. You could define subregions by where they appeared for different observers. And if you did experiments over and over, you would decide they were correlated. That if something appeared to be here, and the observer would have to have two eyes so they could do parallax, and this observer would have two eyes, um, if it appeared to be here in the imaginary space of this one, it would always appear to be here in the imaginary space of that one. And, and in general, so you, that's a sort of an operational way of redoing the definition of manifold. You could think of the observers as defining coordinate patches on their past by where things appear to be. And then you could use that to um, redefine a, a manifold here. So you could say that you could have regions, and, and because they would all be identified like that, they would form a distributive uh, lattice. Now suppose instead, you have a superposition of two metrics. So there's some probability you're in one metric, and there's some probability you're in another. Now you can think of the metric as being a rule that tells you how the geodesics propagate back. Curvature is all about how near ge nearby geodesics deviate from one another. So the two different metrics would impose two different correlations on the apparent space in the past of two different observers. So they wouldn't agree anymore. So if you took a region that was defined in one of the metrics and asked, where is it with respect to the other metric, well, you could say it's in some large subregion. I mean, it, the deviation of the curvature might not be too much. So you could say it's in some large region. But if you started, took that large region and divided it into smaller regions, you could easily reach a point where no point here consistently seemed to be in any region there. So if you just unfold that, you see it's a violation of the distributive law. A intersect the union of bi equals a. A intersect bi equals empty set. Distributive law fails. So if you just insist that regions here have to be empirically defined by where things appear to be to, to many different observers, uh, then if, if the thing is quantum mechanical, then the, the, the subregions form um, a non distributive lattice. It's sort of like if you thought that the space time was a superposition of many different um, simplicial complexes. If you ask, okay, if I'm here in this simplicial complex, where am I in the other? It doesn't really have an unambiguous answer. So you see, the, the absolute, I mean, the points don't only disappear because they're points and points are too small, they also disappear because they're not 
they're, they're, we're naively thinking they're absolute, but in fact they're, 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 they're relational. And so, you know, in the sense that things in the middle of a quantum process aren't real, they're not real, they're not simultaneously real. They, they live in a superposition. So, um, now, the mathematical structure that comes out of trying to put this all together, it's not a, a, the usual kind of topos because we're getting non-distributive lattices. So the kind of structure that would appear in this picture over a site of observers, each observer, you can just take the quantum mechanical description of what it sees, and that would give you an algebra of operators. And then the geometric way of thinking about that is that it's something called a quantel, which is a non-distributive lattice. And you would be piecing all of these things together and discovering correlations, and what you would be doing out of that would be building a quantiloid. So the, um, the place where this geometry would appear would be in the category of sheaves over a quantiloid. Those are very interesting categories. There's four papers on it. It's a, it's a very recent development. Most of it is 21st century. The most important papers were written in Lithuania. Uh, both of them. But <laughs> um, my ancestors came from Lithuania, but I'm, I'm not sentimentally attached to it. Um, uh, but the, um, it's like a topos, but it has an additional structure. And there is one paper on its internal logic. And the internal logic of the, she of the category of sheaves over a, a quantiloid is a quantum logic. So in other words, a, an op operational point of view on experiments would be natural in this larger structure. It's built up out of non-distributive uh, lattices. And the, quant the category of quantiloids is very well behaved. It has good quotient objects and good products. So we have all the tools to try to construct something like that. So that's the general suggestion. That's where I was as of about uh, six months ago when I came here to talk to Chris, and um, Chris Isham. And um, he told me two very important things. I mean, uh, I thought he would, I don't know. It's, it's a very different point of view from the site of, of, of contexts. Observers are observers, contexts are contexts. The two points of view could very well turn out to be complementary. I mean, so the thought is the same, but it seems that we arrive at a different species of, of, of topos in um, um, carrying in carrying this out. But one thing he told me over and over again was there's no data. And the other thing he told me was the name of an author who had thought about reconstruction. See, because I have the idea that that's all very nice. That's the abstract mathematical form. How do I construct anything? So the way I have to construct anything has to be that I ask, what does a highly curved region of space-time actually look like to an observer in its future? And I have to find a mathematical structure in that that I can use to construct the category. So he, the, 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 the person he had me read turned out to be the first. That there, there's, the relativists don't know much about this, but the question of what a highly curved region of space-time looks like is very interesting to the astrophysicists. So the principle I'm arguing here is um, relational. Geometry equals apparent geometry. So in other words, we ask, how does it actually look? And I think there's a way around the, 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 the data problem if you're willing to extrapolate. So the next thing I want to propose is the telescope, microscope, analogy. So in other words, if I was looking at a small region of space-time where quantum gravity was significant, it would be highly curved and there would be high probabilities of singularities appearing. It would be a very bumpy region of space-time with a quantum superposition of many different sets of bumps. Okay, 
But we know what things look like when viewed through regions like that because we've pointed our telescopes at distant galaxies and tried to look either past a single galaxy or through a star cluster. And so there's a very rich mathematical theory of how a region like that looks, how you can tell its geometry from looking at what you see when you look through it. It's called gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing is sort of joint work between groups of mathematicians and groups of astrophysicists. And there are books that have lots of theorems and then computer projections of what generic things look like and then pictures from the sky. So if you're willing to extrapolate, there's data. So can we then understand, so the program I'm proposing is first understand mathematically what gravitational lensing is telling us, find a mathematical description of it, extrapolate it from the large to the small, and then quantize by summing over histories. Now, the reason I think this is tractable is because when the astrophysicists went over, over the heads of the relativists and showed this to the mathematicians, it turned out the mathematicians had an incredibly rich, powerful structure that just... And what it is, is singularity theory. Now, singularity theory is almost as, as, as much of an orphan as category theory, undeservedly bad reputation, I think partly due to the unfortunate influence of René Thom. Singularity theory was first invented back when, when I was, I was um, alive and kicking, and it was called catastrophe theory. And um, for a while, it was supposed to explain everything with the same diagram. And then people found out, A, the classification was wrong, B, it didn't really explain everything, C, it was too full of philosophy, and D, nobody really trusted René Tom. And, and so it disappeared from the public eye. And a group of very good Russian mathematicians quietly picked it up, the leader of which was V.I. Arnold. So at this point, it's a very developed theory. It asks the question, locally, what does a function look like modulo diffeomorphism invariance? So diffeomorphism invariance is this great mystery in relativity, and here the mathematicians have solved it sort of piece by piece. Now, it turns out this is just what you need to understand what happens when something gets diffused through a globular cluster. What you're seeing is, I mean, it's too, it's too complicated to even think about getting the exact mass distribution right and write down a closed solution. But what you're seeing is a generic solution. And the, the problem of how the wavefront transforms is what's called a Lagrangian singularity problem. And one of Arnold's very brilliant contributions was to reduce that to the singularities of functions. So look, this is what a function of one variable looks like if it's generic. If, if, if it stops for a while, that's infinite number of derivatives being zero. It's not generic. It's probability zero. So modulo diffeomorphism invariance, it's only a finite amount of information because it goes up and down from the maxima to the minima, and any one can be trans changed into the other one by diffeomorphing the domain. So we know how to do the same thing in higher dimensions, and it corresponds exactly to what we see when we look through a highly curved region in space-time. So Arnold has gone on. This is a very developed subject. We know how to take families of these pictures and turn them into complexes. There's a, these complexes, they're, they're more general than simplicial complexes. But the general structure of what we would see can be resolved into a complex. So my idea is that we have to take this analysis a bit farther than the astrophysicists did. They know what a picture looks like, and then they know what a movie looks like. They know what the most general evolution over time goes. So in addition to that, we need moves on movies, and we need panoramas, two-dimensional families of views. And that will be the data from which we will have to construct a quantum theory. So that's going to be completely analyzable into these complexes. We can replace the continuum thing by some over discrete things. And then we, but it's directly related to the observer. So we can cut off the level of complexity of the complex at what the observer can see. And that becomes a finite sum. And these complexes 
are more general type than simplicial complexes. But I believe that the tools that allowed us to construct topological state sums or gravitational state sums on simplicial complexes can be generalized to study them too. So we will be able to study apparent geometry. We'll be able to take a look at what it, see, if you shine a light behind a highly curved region of space-time, you almost never see a single image. In fact, there's theorems that under certain conditions it's impossible to see only a single image. You'll see multiple images. And as you move your head around and or weight, they move around and they combine and they separate and new ones appear. But these histories are not just sets of points. These histories are complexes. In the simple case, when you just take a picture and you see multiple images, that's a Morse function. So you're really seeing a picture of a simplicial complex of the space-time, viewed as a space of paths. I believe that paths are more fundamental than events. The question of whether you arrive at the same place by two events becomes a quantum mechanical thing, so you don't identify things down to B points. It's, it's a sum over processes. But these processes have the structure of complex. In the simplest case, they're Morse functions. But then there are transitions between them and higher order transitions. And so since everything we know how to do using category theory to get topological information of manifolds can be thought of as boiling down to looking at Morse functions, I mean handle bodies, that's what they are. Hagar decompositions, that's what they are. Even simplicial complexes, that's really what they are. So we're doing that, and so we know how to construct categorical expressions for the probability amplitudes for them. And then we have to extend it to include the singularities, transitions to the singularities. And there's more math there. The singularities correspond to the classification of Lie groups. And really, the stuff that's emerged in our, from Arnold and his school is incredible. There's a very small number of generic singularities that can possibly appear. And there's a correspondence, they have Dinkin diagrams, they correspond to the simple Lie groups. And my naive calculation, if, if we go up from movies to moves on movies to panoramas, we get up to A6, D6, and E6. So the most complicated thing we will have will have E6 symmetry. There's a more delicate calculation that I have to make yet. So all of these things now, we, we, Near the singularity, there's this hidden symmetry, which is related to the vial group. So what's going to happen, in order to construct a quantum theory here, we're going to have to do a higher categorical thing where we sort of piece together representations of different um, quantum groups, which turn out to be complementary to quantum vial groups. And we're going to have to use that to piece together a quantum theory of panoramas. And then that will be a reasonable candidate for quantum theory of general relativity in this context. You see, we'll still be summing over complexes, but instead of simplicial complexes, they'll be a little bit more complicated. But the, what we gain from having them be a little bit more complicated is that they're empirical. They're what you actually see. Think about looking through a bent up piece of glass and seeing the multiple images and trying to recover the structure of the glass from the multiple images. Only in this case you can't go inside, so that's all there is. So in the limit of the classical limit, presumably the images all coalesce and you end up with things that look like points to a reasonable approximation. So that all still has to be done. There's an enormous amount of work to do. But there's so much math just sitting there. Um, I didn't know anything about singularity theory until I learned about um, um, starting out reading the things that, that Chris told me to read and learning about gravitational lensing. And then all of these subtle structures that have appeared in this branch of mathematics um, just naturally reappear in it. So, um, so I believe there's a way of making the synthesis of this higher categorical picture, which is the sum over simplices, with relating things to observers. Different observers will see different cl classes of things. And then we're going to have to have some sort of consistency relation, which will be rigid enough to define what kind of quantum theory it has to be. That isn't done yet. But so much of the math is just there. So many of the different things 
And I had heard of hope. I mean, I was hoping against hope that I would even be able to see complexes because I wanted something that would select families of complexes. But that's exactly what you see. The view that you see is a complex. OK, so that's this picture. And it's very much not done at all. Um, it's not even written. Uh, so, um, so that's the, the general picture um, that, that, I've, I've, that I've been working on the last year or so. Um, but I think this theory of Arnold, you know, if there's something very daunting about trying to replace the continuum with any discrete theory. Anything you can come up with seems to be somehow too naive. It's like the, the citadel of analysis is too vast to be attacked from outside. So you have to burrow from within and explode it from within. But the most brilliant work in analysis I've, I've ever read um, does exactly that. It says almost all functions are really finite complexes. So, and after all, if we have a categorical point of view, it's really the functions and not the spaces we need to worry about. So, so it seems that, that, that there's actually, I mean, that the structure here actually is the basis for making the step of replacing the continuum with the sum over discrete things in a way that would con contain all of the structure of the smooth maps, really, because you really are looking at the states of smooth maps and then just throwing away the parts that are very, very high degeneracy and therefore measure zero anyhow. OK, and um, I did promise something about not standing between you and the pub, so I think perhaps I should stop now. Actually, I'm sorry, I don't think I'm, Carlo Ravel, I mean, uh, I, I've been closely related to Carlo in several of the things he's written, but he's very prolific, and I don't actually think I know that much about that. He's it was him, it was a collaborator. Ah, but he's very interested in foundations of quantum mechanics in ways I don't understand very well, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> yes? Well, that's the, OK. Um, Carlo Rovelli came up with this formulation of relational quantum mechanics after he and I were talking for a year or so. I was talking about the categorical approach to quantum mechanics, that there are many different observers, and then there have to be relations between them. He, he sort of wanted to de-emphasize the category theory and, and talk more about relational. There are many different Hilbert spaces, and then there have to be maps between them. But, uh, it, it's just sort of different packaging for the same set of ideas. Yeah, so you mentioned four papers on sheaves on a quantile, a quantile way. There was actually somebody here in the audience who has written five. So <laughs> one guy who's not in Lithuania. But he just left, I think. He got his oh, dear. I hope he didn't <laughs> stalk out it. <laughs> I don't know the whole literature then. Yeah. <laughs> there isn't much literature. I know it's, very <coughs> it's a very strange history. It began from two completely different places. People who were trying to make a non-commutative geometri geometry out of quantum mechanics, and very abstract category theorists who were interested in the very natural problem of categories enriched in categories of lattices. And they turn out to fuse completely. It, it, it's very interesting that way. <laughs> 